how many of us have gone to work and we have the coworker or colleague that's always got drama going in their life or creates drama around you or tries to do it with you? Or maybe it's like someone in your family that's all you, we, wow, we could tell some stories on yeah, that. Yeah, we could. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> there's the people who blame everybody but themselves. Do we all know someone like that? That's convenient. Yep, and then there's the people that sweep you off your feet, Ooh. only to not be that person. I've been through that. Yes, you have. Yes, and then it's a big wake-up call. But anyway, these people are all known as high-conflict personalities, and um, apparently there's over 35 million of them in our country, in America, and um, they come in contact with all of us. And they can really mess with our, our life, our business, our careers, our relationships, and it's just not fun to be around. It's, it's stressful, and who needs more of that? High drama is not a thing I like. You know, it, it's, Unless it's, it's hiking like a mountain. the person, you know, we all we have that saying that this person brings out the worst in me. Mm-hmm. I think that that is who a high conflict person is. That's if the you allow them to. Yeah, it's somebody who makes you turn into someone you try not to be. Well, and they can also get quite violent. So we have licensed clinical social worker, family law specialist, and mediator Bill Eddy joining us on Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour show today. That's right. We always want a social worker and a mediator and a law mm. specialist to come on a happy hour show. Uh, but he's going to talk about the insight in his newly re- released book, uh, excellent book. It's called Five Types of People Who Can Ruin Your Life, Identifying and Dealing with Narcissists, Sociopaths, and Other High-Conflict Personalities. You can get it on Amazon now. Um, also go to his website, highconflictinstitute.com, because that's right. He's a co-founder and president of High Conflict Institute in San Diego, and I didn't even know we needed one, but apparently we do, especially when you read his book. Welcome, Bill. How are you? I'm doing great. Now that I know what's in the book, it's a lot easier to live my life, but I'm glad to be on and, and excited to share this information with you and your listeners. Well, thank you, and congratulations on the release of your book. And, I, you know, I have to... I never thought of like grouping these kinds of personalities and people we deal with into like the title of high conflict personalities. I never thought I'd be reading a book that labels it as such and deals with this and tells you truly how to to maneuver and work around these personalities. But I also didn't know that a whole institute would be dedicated to this. Um, what led you to opening an institute and then writing the book as well? Well, uh, the Institute's 10 years old as of last month, and uh, I basically, because I've been working as a therapist, as a lawyer, and as a mediator, dealing with people's conflicts all day long, and I started seeing patterns and started seeing, you know, people, I'm helping people get out of high conflict relationships at work and divorces with their neighbors. And I should really write a book about how to not get into those situations. So around the same time we started High Conflict Institute giving seminars, uh, I started teaching and writing about this problem, which has only grown in the last 10 years. So I, I think this is something that a couple of generations ago didn't have to deal with so much. But nowadays, we all really need to know who are high conflict people and how can we either deal with them or kind of ease them out of our lives. Mm-hmm. Can, can you explain, just give a quick overview um, of a high conflict personality and also tell us why this is on the rise? Okay. Well, first of all, think of four key characteristics. People with high conflict personalities have a pattern of blaming other people, which means they don't take responsibility themselves. It's always somebody else's fault. They have a lot of all or nothing thinking, like it's all your fault or it's my way or the highway, those types of things. They often have unmanaged emotions. So they may start yelling or run out of a room in the middle of a conversation. Uh, The emotions kind of take over. And sometimes they apologize and sometimes they don't. They say, I was right to do that. And lastly, is they, they engage in behavior that's extreme. And in many cases, they do things that 90% of people would never do. So that's always a question to ask. But it's those four key characteristics, blaming, 
all or nothing thinking, unmanaged emotions, and extreme behaviors. So that's Mm -hmm. what we're seeing. Now, your second question was, why are we seeing more of this? So personality development, because I've worked with, you know, as a mental health professional Mm -hmm. with young children and parents, et cetera, is personality development's really got three parts. It's got what you're born with, kind of your genetic tendencies. Then mostly your early childhood makes a big difference because your personality is is mostly developing by five or six years old. So those first few years mean a lot. But the third is what our culture is. And I would suggest that our culture is what's changed the most in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And that part of our culture is seeing images of high conflict behavior over and over and over again. If you look at how much time children spend about seven hours a day now watching screens Mm -hmm. and some adults spend eight hours a day watching screens. So part of that might be Facebook Mm -hmm. on your cell phone, but part of that's watching movies, watching the TV news, all of that. And what we're seeing today is the most extreme behavior Because all these methods are competing for our attention, and to grab our attention, they have to show stuff that's extreme. So for adults, what we're seeing is this rise of high-conflict entertainment, but for kids, it's training. And so that's part of their personality development. So we're seeing that seeming to be on the rise. You know, right now, when you when you look at how our country is divided because of the political atmosphere we're all living through, you can't help but wonder that you know when children are are seen, just even the news has become kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to find the right word. It, it's just angry that the children, if they see this, they think this is the way to behave because if adults are behaving that way that is what they think they should behave like as well yeah not just on the news it's on in facebook it's it's you know parents talking with other parents or arguing amongst families yeah it's really what we've done in many ways is simplified complex problems and relationships into all good and all bad people And so that Mm. all or nothing Mm. view, people are blaming each other when in many cases the problem might be something everybody contributes to at least a little bit. Mm. And frankly, I don't think we're as polarized as the media tells us, but I do think we are polarized. But my neighbors and my relatives, we get along. But you hear about people, you know, hating each other because of their point of view. And, and, and we can't keep hearing that without it getting us to think, wow, we really have to watch out for those evil people out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it builds something. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask about, because in the book you talk about absolutely how to, con- you know, kind of control the situation when you're dealing with a high conflict personality and HCP and you have a great method for us to all learn how to do this. Um, But when you talk about some of these people can become violent, there's suicide. And I look at suicide rates. We're actually doing a segment on this coming up uh, this month about uh, teenager suicide rates escalating, um, especially because of social media and one of the high conflict personalities you talk about is like suicide is directly related. I look at that, the numbers of that going up, and also these violent incidences we're having around this, uh, not just in this country, it is in other countries too, but all these shootings where people just kind of do this snap. We've had that personally in our in our family where our uh, my uncle Nancy's brother was murdered because um, – and the employee just snapped when he was my my uncle let him go and he turned around and killed everybody and just oh. shot him all in the back. It was the split decision and later we found out that he did have some mental health issues, but they 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 weren't checked out when he, my uncle hired him. But he just snapped and I wonder about people not recognizing those signs of people just snapping and how much stress and all of this stuff that's going on suicide shootings stress levels, people just acting out. 
Are are these yeah. all HCPs? Well, I think many of them are. And I want to say something right now, and that is they're not evil people. Right. They're not bad people. And in fact, no one chooses to have a high conflict personality. People with high conflict personalities often are depressed and anxious and frustrated because they haven't learned the skills of balance and how to get along with other people. So they take things too personally. Uh, They overreact. They can't manage their own emotions. So part of what we see with, um, with suicide and with these mass shootings is these aren't ordinary people. And that's important to know. It isn't like an ordinary person suddenly changes like that, unless there's some kind of uh, physical illness in their brain or something like that. But for most people, it's people who struggled all their lives and they could, they, they, they might have done it a week before or a week later or maybe not at all. It's just it's like this balance. Mm. And I've worked a lot with uh, kids and parents and suicidal teenagers um, in in many ways just don't have the skills yet. And a lot of Mm -hmm. us that work in mental health call suicide a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Mm -hmm. And if you can just get the the teen or whoever it is to just get through today and learn some new skills, then they, they may not be able to, they may not have this problem. There's so many people have had suicidal thoughts in their lifetime that never committed suicide or hurt anybody else. And it's really a lack of skills, but it's, it's something to pay attention to. If someone talks that way, and that's one thing I mentioned in the book, is pay attention to people's words. If they talk like things are hopeless or so-and-so doesn't deserve to live or I'm, everything's wrong with me, those are signs, those all-or-nothing signs uh, to watch out for. So I agree with you that this is increasing with suicide, but I think it's, it's not the average person who has average skills. It's someone who's stuck, may have, and we don't say that teenagers have personality disorders. They're too young to be that stuck. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But they may have warning signs. So they may have all or nothing thinking. You know, let me just briefly say something about teenagers. The five types of high conflict people include narcissists, sociopaths, borderline, paranoid, and histrionic. But when you're talking about teenagers, on any given day, you're looking at narcissistic, sociopathic, <laughs> borderline, paranoid, yeah. and histrionic. So, yeah. so it's the pattern that's stuck that's the mm. issue. And, but if you see warning signs, it's good to give people attention and see if they could use some help. So how much of this is, um, can, you mentioned that you were born with some of these tendencies you know, it's like, okay, uh, is it really in your DNA? And if it is, is it something that you can actually change? Well, it seems to be that it's it's on kind of a continuum. So for some people, this may be most of who they are, and especially sociopaths, people who often are criminal population, but con artists, sometimes, sometimes they're business people on Wall Street. Um, But sociopaths are one of the personalities that seems to be more inborn than the others. But with that said, I believe that all people have some ability to be influenced by their environment, especially early childhood. So if you have a sociopathic child, but you give them a really good upbringing, they might not get into legal trouble. They may not hurt anybody, even if they lie more than the average person and, you know, maybe they steal some things. So environment does make a difference. I also want to say, even as adults, people are on a continuum with this. So some people are going to probably be next to impossible to change, but other people may be able to change some. And I think it's worth encouraging people, you know, you might want to get some counseling for that. You know, you may want to, you know, maybe there's some meds to help you feel less stressed because high conflict people are super stressed all the time because it doesn't work for them what they're doing. 
I, I don't want to say all the time because sometimes you can't tell that under the surface they're stressed, but on the surface they do okay, uh, maybe for weeks or months, but then it eventually shows up. But I, I want to say that it is possible for people to change if they want to change. That's the mm -hmm. biggest factor. If mm -hmm. somebody wants to change, they have self-awareness and they say, I want to change what I'm, how I'm doing things, that's a really good sign. So do you think that's it's kind of like addiction where you need help, you need counseling, you have to say, okay, I'm going to make these steps. This is something I need to absolutely change in my life. It becomes like a new lifestyle almost. You have to adopt new habits and think more, you know, <laughs> instead of just, you know, letting. Reacting. Yeah, just reacting. So, you know, and get help because. I don't think you can do it on your own, right, when, when you want to change something, you know, this big in your personality. Absolutely. It really takes a lot of repetition, a lot of practice. And it's, in many ways it's parallel to addiction. So mm -hmm. they have the same problem is denial. Denial is a big part of addiction. People say, oh, I don't have a problem. I can, have, I can stop at four drinks, you know. <laughs> and mm. and it's like that with <laughs> high later, conflict personalities. Yeah. They think, they yeah. say, oh, I'm the greatest. I don't get into trouble. People love me. And you're thinking, I don't know anyone that loves you. <laughs> but <laughs> they, they need to, it's something, sometimes some event breaks through and they go, I better get some help. For example, narcissists, that's mm -hmm. one of these five. Types, and narcissists who have a target of blame. That's when they're HCP. So not all narcissists have a target of blame. They maybe just make their own lives miserable. But some make other people's lives miserable. But narcissists, it's interesting as a therapist, I, I think I only had a couple narcissists during the period I was a therapist. And they, they seem to start around 40 that they start realizing that things really aren't working for them. Up until then, they think they're the greatest, and everyone thinks they're the greatest. Then after the like fourth divorce and getting fired ten times, they go, you know, maybe I have a problem here. I once did couples counseling with a couple that was trying to decide whether to split up or not. And it was the wife's second marriage and the husband's fourth marriage. And in the middle of something the wife said, the husband said, you know what? I'm starting to think maybe I have a problem. And I was like, yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Work on that. <laughs> wow, yeah. yeah. So, and it takes a lot to really acknowledge and, and take ownership of it, like we were yeah. saying. You know, I've, I have a question, too, in regards to the paranoid personality because – we had a band actually in San Diego back when we used to live in your area. And um, the drummer <laughs> oh, was dear. incredibly paranoid, which I later, and I was really naive. I was completely naive to the drug scene of, of the world. <laughs> I was really, really naive. I didn't That's understand okay. what crack or meth or what of that, you know, I knew that there was acid and pot and hash, you know, or whatever, those main things, cocaine, you hear about that, mm. but none of these chemical stuff, none of it. That's and because she was raised outside. Yeah. Of and we had just got back from South Africa and moved here. And you anyway, were what, 18, 19, 19 oh, it was a 21 by the time we got mm. to California, but I just didn't get it. And, you know, half of the band was like, this guy is on crack and meth. And I'm like, what? What, do you, what is that, you know? And I remember going to pick him up for rehearsal, and he thought the military was spying into his hotel room and all this stuff or, you know, where he was staying. <laughs> I mean, and it went crazy. I mean, it just went on and on and on, and eventually he had to leave the band. And um, eventually we had to stop playing bands because of this kind of habit that we saw was going around. But And, and us doing a magazine, but what... I wonder is, do are any of these personalities developed through long-term drug use of that kind of nature? If you're paranoid every time you're doing getting high, as soon as, if you try to get clean, aren't you just going to be that kind of paranoid? Any like you've developed a new personality through drugs. Well, it's interesting because hmm. these are two separate problems that often overlap. 
So substances can make people paranoid while they're using the substance. And Mm -hmm. then, and I've worked in substance abuse treatment. And so when people stop the substance and get clean and sober, a lot of them are no longer paranoid. So it wasn't a personality trait. It really was a substance abuse trait. And so that's, that's a good sign. But occasionally, with substances, people get clean and sober, and their behavior gets worse. And that's because sometimes the substances cover up a personality disorder. So let's say someone's growing up with a personality disorder that may have had tendencies starting at birth, and so they knew that things were kind of out of sorts and had a hard time managing themselves. And people with personality disorders have a higher incidence of substance abuse. So they often use alcohol and other drugs, stimulants, uh, depressants, et cetera, to manage their out of control emotions and maybe out of control behavior. So that then, let's say that starts around 12 or 14, because that's often when people start getting into drugs. Then let's say they're 23, 24 now, and they get clean and sober. Then you see the underneath, the personality that was underneath, and that's when you know this person needs more help. It's not just the substance. So they could occur independently or together. That's a very good issue to raise. Yeah. Wow. That's that's amazing. But first, 12 to 14 years old, that's not cool. 12 to 14 years old, that's just not cool. You know, yeah, that's... That's 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 when a a lot of people start. It's sad to say, but their friends or even their parents may start them on pot or something or give them too much alcohol, et cetera. So a lot of kids we see, that's when they get started. It's sad. Wow. Wow. This This is such a fascinating conversation because, you know, you see... I, I know exactly the type of person you're talking about, you know, who's gotten clean and sober, and it's like, well, you know, sometimes there's that conversation, oh, well, you're not fun anymore, but that's, yeah. you know, and I <laughs> nice. hate to say that, sorry, but there's, that's, a, that's a saying that's been around there, and some people won't get cleaned up because of that saying, you know, and that's, and that's unfortunate, but it's a, it's a truth out there. Um, the other thing I was going to ask about a personality where there's people that we, I, we've all got to know these people. I know several of them. And eventually I just have to distance myself away from it because I, I personally just can't, I can't stand it. Um, in all honesty, I just can't be around this drama. There's people that, and it's, it's, there's the blame game that you talk about where they just always blame, blame, blame. But there's people that I feel like they're in this tumbleweed where they're creating, there's, and sometimes even if it's a natural disaster, it's like they keep going from one drama to the next. And it's mm. almost like they're, body is saying here i want to have a drama it's, it's like a chaos it's thing. like a chaos factor but it brings yeah. in things that they didn't control like someone could you know get in a car accident and then they get robbed but they're like high drama kind of people but things that they didn't create start to happen to them yeah what what we see is and and all of these high conflict personalities, that's characteristic of them. They draw attention to themselves. They want attention. And sometimes the more histrionic personalities are the most intense with the drama, making things up if there isn't something exciting enough to talk about. And so it's almost like they're addicted to the drama. It's, and it looks like an mm. addiction sometimes. But here's the thing is the people around them, Don't try to argue them out of that. Instead, the approach that I put in the book is the CARS Mm -hmm. method. And I can talk about that briefly when you're Mm -hmm. ready. But the idea is take a calming approach that focuses on the future. Don't get stuck arguing with them about the past or about reality. Just say, well, let's look at your choices now. And so that way you don't get stuck in the drama with them. And you can also say, wow, that's really interesting. Well, you know what? I get to go right now. I've got something else I've got to do. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> have a nice day. I like that. Yeah, you don't have to listen. I love these situations in your book because you, you get us to think and you show examples. And 
you know, and you're like, well, this person's going to come back. If you say this, this is how they're going to say it back to you. Or like it can get, like you do not want to provoke these people because, and I look at now yeah. with social media, people like, if especially in a business situation, they can start on and trash you. They can do a, a smear campaign. I mean, it's like you they have to. They can fire you. They can fire you. They, I mean, they can get violent. So how you handle things, because you say that some of them are really vindictive and revengeful, how you communicate is, you know, you have to be nice to them but still have to have like a, a, a boundary, set a boundary, but without them realizing you're setting a boundary. Exactly. That's the S of the CARS method in that setting limits. And you can, and people don't realize it's not rude to say, I've got something else I've got to do, goodbye, because everybody always has something else they could be doing. So it's, but it's gentle. It's not mm-hmm. saying, you're a jerk, so I'm walking out. It's mm-hmm. saying, you know, good luck with that, you know, uh, but I got to go. So <laughs> you don't engage. Um, but you're not hostile either. That's that's when it mm-hmm. really gets escalated is when people try to yell someone out of how they feel or think, and that just doesn't work. No. So you have to be in control yourself. You know, um, I, I know I've, I've, for our listeners I've said this story, I've told this story before, but I'm interested in how I should have handled it because I obviously handled it really wrong. Um, I had this boss that would come down the row between all the secretary's desks, and he had he he made us keep our staplers on the corner of the desk when he went down the aisle. He'd hit the stapler on the left, hit the stapler on the right. He made all this noise, hitting everybody's staplers as he went down the aisle. And for some reason, I found it really annoying. <laughs> So, <laughs> That's annoying. I, I, really annoying, like really annoying. <laughs> and after about two months of working there, I decided that I would move the stapler just as he was going to try and hit it, which I did. And he hit the desk with his fist, and I got fired. And I'm thinking, no, okay, that was not the way to handle it. But I don't know how you would handle something like that without, I mean, Saying stop it, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always have choices. So yeah. why don't I talk about that for a couple yeah. minutes? With the cars method, the first part is connecting with the person, like uh, you know, how's your day going, or hey Bob, how you doing, or something. Sometimes distracting somebody. So when he gets to your desk, to say, hey Bob, I enjoyed that uh, meeting last week, or something. Uh, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Connecting with them in a positive way may divert them from trying to connect in a negative way. Sometimes. Mm. It's not always Mm. true. Then Mm. the A in the CARS method is analyzing options. So look at what your choices are. And it may be you decide that you like the company, but you don't like that boss. So you look into getting a transfer. Mm. Or you may decide that it's time to move on or maybe put your leave your uh, resume in the copy machine so that someone stumbles upon it and goes, "Uh uh-oh, we're about to lose Lisa Mm -hmm. or Nancy or whoever, and we don't want that to happen. And the other is sometimes someone like that is so impossible, you're healthier just to get out of there. Mm -hmm. So it's analyzing what are your options. And when you stop and think, you're going to make better decision than just reacting. Um, And it may be that little test you gave him helped you see we can't work together. And that probably was your lucky day. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm not sorry I left or it was just I didn't want to get fired, but it didn't matter. I had a job within a couple of days, but, you know, just it was just so weird. (laughs) Well, I think one of the, the one of the most important things besides recognizing these personalities and part of it is you know, being aware, and that's what I love about your book is, you know, being aware, you know, people walk around with their cell phone in their face and walk into poles and cars on the street, you know, because, (laughs) but that's how our culture has grown into this um, lack of awareness, yet here we are with all this information at our fingertips. However, we've become just like walking zombies in a way. And even when you see people going out to dinner, even at first date, people are sitting with their phones. I'm like, what are you doing? And so I wonder sometimes, 
of people listening? Are they looking at, you know, body language, truly hearing what someone is saying? And, you know, because people do tell you who they are. Are they hearing and really observing those inner voices that go, dude, this isn't cool. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, they're inflating this over here and maybe this person is, you know, the first date syndrome, you know, you, especially women, they already start, you know, imagining the wedding, you know, <laughs> they're meeting some guy, oh, it's the prince, you know, <laughs> prince charming and they can already see the house and the suburbs and the kids. And I only have to the wedding this, dress. this and that. Yeah, and oh, I want to <laughs> fix them, you know, but this is that awareness um, that we, actually sometimes squash those little red flags that pop up. Yeah, we we miss a lot. 90% of human communication is body language and tone of voice. And mm-hmm. you don't get either of those over the Internet, you know, on yeah. Facebook or, or email, mm-hmm. et cetera. And the little emoticons barely scratch the surface. Uh, you know, you can't tell, is that a joke? Or was that serious, what they just no said? If they put a smile symbol, is the smile symbol a joke? Or, or was sarcastic. that serious? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, Whereas when like you're a- sitting with somebody, you can usually tell the difference between a joke and a serious sarcasm or criticism. So we're missing, we're missing a lot. And my theory is that the stuff we see on screens has to be more emotional to hold our attention. So we're shifting from the more logical Uh problem solving to more emotional reacting Mm. and faces and voices, et cetera, are more emotional. So we're actually losing, you know, human progress. You know, once they, once humans learned how to write and then how to publish books and things for which I'm very appreciative. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But now we're going backwards. We're going we're getting shorter attention spans, more emotional reactions, and yet they're not appropriate and they're not tuned in reactions. They're just coarse reactions. You watch the news and at the end of the news, you want to break the TV. I know. And it's like, that's not a, that doesn't mean you learned anything, but that's what happens to us. And mm-hmm. it happens to me. <laughs> and it's compounding. It's, but it, it's, it's compound hard. emotional interest. We used to, to yeah. try. It's to contagious. Find, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, it, it's, it's, like a, it's like because we're herd animals. If one does it, we all do it. <laughs> Mm. Um, Unfortunately, that's exactly true. Yeah. Yeah, I I watch nature a lot, and I I always my mind goes, okay, this person's acting like this. I'm like, that's that kind of animal behavior right over there, mm-hmm. and then be careful because it will bite. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all yep. animals it's, will bite. <laughs> exactly. You know, and you can yeah. you can learn a lot by sitting and watching animals. They. Uh, I feel like we used to struggle to find exactly the right words when we used to handwrite letters and type letters and really think to make sure the person who received the letter didn't get the wrong idea. Now, let's just go to cell phone communication where most of the words are not spelled correctly, and if if they use words, and then all these little symbols and the fact that people feel now they can say the the meanest things, whatever they want, and then put a smiley face and it's okay. Right. Like, I didn't really mean it because I put a smiley face after I just told you what I really don't like about you. And that's where we are right now. I'm going to respectfully tell you how much you irritate me, smiley face. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. yeah. Right. I mean, it, and so I think this whole behavior is actually – Taking someone who has a high conflict personality that might normally have been able to to not be so annoying or you know so overreactive and causing them to be overreactive even more so because everybody's pushing buttons. Yes, and and environment matters even moment to moment. So if the mm-hmm. people around mm-hmm. you are criticizing you and you have some of these tendencies, then it's going to bring them out more. If the people around you are being respectful, friendly, have empathy for you, it's going to bring out the best. So I'm talking about 10% of the population Mm -hmm. and 
the 35 million number is North America, so that's the United States and Canada. Mm-hmm. But 10% of North America population, and maybe around the world, seem to have this high conflict pattern, mm. and it overlaps with traits of personality disorders. But the idea mm-hmm. is that this this is something that we can learn to manage, but we mm-hmm. also influence each other. So you can almost decide if you're going to make that person angry or make that person happy. And if they tend towards high conflict behavior, you're going to have to work a little harder at keeping things calm. So the trick is by managing your own emotions, you can actually manage high conflict people. So if you can stay really calm, matter of fact, friendly, give them empathy, attention, and respect, they tend to calm down quite quickly. If you criticize them, tell them they're stupid, things like that, they jump out of their chair or mm. out of the computer. <laughs> right. Well, and it's not, it's, and it creates a, a, a easier situation on all. I mean, even, you know, for us to stop and not do the immediate remo- emotional uh, response or, or that reaction right is actually a better way to handle things anyway, and it calms yourself down. I mean, the, the stress level doesn't, you don't have to get into a huge fight or a huge drama. It's not good for anyone. You never know how far it will go. Um, so I like that because you also talk about, hey, you know, we've become these individual communities <laughs> of ourselves, not just, we, we don't have the village like we used to. So things have changed, and we need to really be responsible for our actions. I think your book gives us all the wake up call mm, just for sure because we have gotten into this reactionary lifestyle in a way and uh, maybe not communicating as best as we could so i think it's a good thing for everybody to practice in general um, but you talk about the web method uh, which you've been kind of touching on throughout this conversation but can you tell people how to apply this because it's super cool yeah it's noticing what people's words are, that's the W in web, what your emotions are. In other words, how you feel in response to this person. Does this person make you feel scared, make you feel depressed, make you feel stupid? Um, Or do they make you feel ecstatic, like they're superhuman, they're perfect? Like you said, you're already planning the wedding and buying the house in your mind. Well, the extremes of their words, all or nothing words, blaming words, often give you a hint this may be someone to steer clear of or, you know, not get too close to too fast. So it's extreme words, all or nothing words, blaming words. Your emotions. So if you feel those extreme positive, extreme negative or discomfort, then what you want to do is look below the surface. Don't just go, oh, their words sound great, because that's what con artists do. They have the most beautiful words in the world, but your emotions often tell you, wait, I can't be so sure here. And the last is their behavior. And if they do something that 90% of people would never do, then be suspicious that under the surface is a high conflict pattern. So they punch a hole in the wall. Mm-hmm. or they they throw things and storm out in the middle of a staff meeting or road rage or make threats like suicide or homicide. Those are things that are extreme that 90% of people won't do, and there may be a pattern underneath it that you want to be careful about. So that's the web method. It's actually fairly simple. It just takes practice. Words, their words, your emotions, their behavior. Is it okay to just walk away or, like, hang up the phone? Yeah. That's my technique. <laughs> I just hang up. Yeah. <laughs> I just go, like, that's enough of that. I give people enough, well, you, like, you know, I can't do this right now, or, you know what, I really need to go, or whatever. If they continue on, I just walk away, or I just hang up the phone. <laughs> I'm terrible about that because I, I can't I, – I really – people that are like – I just – I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, and I – I think we have to feel okay about setting limits with high conflict behavior. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do is tell them, usually either I have to go, I've got something else, so good luck with that, and they're still talking, and I can put the phone down because I was was nice. I gave them some empathy. Um, Or if they're saying something really obnoxious, like as a lawyer, I represented 
I've represented victims of mm. domestic violence at times. And I had mm. one woman I represented. Her husband didn't have a lawyer, so he could talk to me. He'd call up and say, Mr. Eddie, you tell that so-and-so. And he'd say mm. these horrible words about her. And I'd say, you know what? You have a choice. Don't use those words, and I'll listen to you. If you keep using those words, I'm going to hang up. It's up to you. And so he says, I don't care. She's a blah, 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 blah. And I said, you've made your choice. Goodbye. Click. The next day yeah. he calls me up, and he wants to talk about something of her. And he says, you tell her that so-and-so. And I said, remember, if you use those words, I'll have to hang up. He said, oh, oh no, no, I won't. I'll try to be careful. I'll try to be careful. And so the next time he didn't do that. And mm. so, but I think it's okay to end a phone conversation or a, a face-to-face conversation. We, we feel like we're being rude, but if the person we're dealing with is being rude, it's not unreasonable to say, I got to go, or you've made your choice, and so I have to stop this conversation. Good, because I've done that a couple of times, and I've, I've, <laughs> I remember, yeah, but I, I just had to kind of go, like, this is enough of this, and I think sometimes in life you get these, you know, even family, I mean, there's, I've, I've totally walked away from family members that are just continual, if you just, there's a point in your life you have to make decisions, like you said, what is your goals, what do you, what, I mean, if, do you want to be around this forever, and sometimes you have to walk away from the drama that is continual and there are people that steal and and manipulate and do crazy lie the lying thing is bizarre to me like people really do like they believe their own lies (laughs) it's amazing it's amazing to me so i think that's a common thing with high conflict people is they tend to lie more than the average and so that is something to be aware of and some of them don't even realize that they're so used yeah. to distorting their reality wow i think that's true and i think they believe they after they've said something once they believe it mm. you know and, and it becomes part of who they are and and they'll say it over and over and over again mm-hmm. and you're like well actually that's not really true yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> It is the way it is. But, Bill, it is time to play Happy Hour. Are you ready? <laughs> it's time. Sure. <laughs> Ring that bell. <laughs> Okay, so, Bill, if you were to spend happy hour with anyone alive or passed on, who would it be and where would you spend happy hour? What are you going to talk about and what are you going to have to drink? It could be alcoholic or non well, the first thing is the person that I've always most been interested in growing up uh, my whole life really is Ben Franklin because oh, he was yeah. a scientist and a politician. Mm. And I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone in history that could combine science and politics like he did. And his politics were good helping with the Constitutional Convention. Everyone talks about the Constitution. Well, the Constitution was pieced together a lot because Ben Franklin was on the scene and he stayed reasonable when everyone else was yelling at each other. Yeah. So Ben Franklin would be the guy. Now, I, what would I drink and where? Well, one of my favorite places, and you talk about happy hour, is in San Diego. It's the Hotel Del Coronado, Mm -hmm. and they face out in the ocean. They've got a great patio bar, and so to me, living in San Diego, this probably isn't a surprise, but I would just love to sit out there and have a margarita, and to be honest, I've done that many times. So my drink would be a margarita. My place would be the Hotel Del Coronado. I'd be chatting with Ben Franklin. I'm saying, oh. how did you do it, Ben? How did you make it all work? Yeah. I love Ben Franklin. Yeah. I think and how he was a negotiator between us and the French, you know, he just kept his calmness, and he was fun. And if you ever read his biography, it is, I mean, that big, thick biography, it is one of the best books ever. <laughs> I love it. I love him. Yeah. He's a fascinating guy, so that would be great. <laughs> I love that he did blend science and politics. I think that's a good maneuver too. I I think it would solve a lot. Yeah, I do. T- I think it's bring him back. Yeah, I like it. Bring back Ben. <laughs> Great choice. And, that's and... what. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. What were you saying? 
I said that's what we need. We need a Ben Franklin now to figure out the science of today's politics. Yeah, that yeah. would be really good. <laughs> I love that. And I I want to have a margarita at the Hotel Dell. I love that area. Yes. Coronado is yeah. so beautiful, and it's haunted, and it's got the beach. I love it. I love that area. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Bill, and for writing your book. I think it's super important for all of us to read. And I know this is going to be a bestseller. It is, because I think so. everyone has to read this. It's really, really good. It gives us such good insight and, and makes us really take control of situations and makes us all think. And I think that's a good thing. Everyone, again, it's by Bill Eddy, and that's E-D-D-Y. And it, the book is called Five Types of People Who Can Ruin Your Life, Identifying and Dealing with Narcissists, Sociopaths, and Other High-Conflict Personalities. You can get it on Amazon now. And also go to his website, High Conflict Institute. Dot com. Thank you so much for all your conversation and advice. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Good luck with your book and take care and enjoy yeah, that margarita. Yeah. <laughs> I will. Thanks. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.